I'm John Emmons, intern at Lawfare, with an episode from the Lawfare Archive for April 8, 2023. Israel has recently conducted a series of airstrikes in Gaza and Lebanon in response to a spate of rocket attacks, which Israel credits to the militant group Hamas, fired from southern Lebanon into northern Israel. For today's Archive episode, I selected an episode from August 2014, during what would come to be known as the 2014 Gaza War, or Operation Protective Edge. The episode features a discussion of Israel's military strategy against Hamas's guerrilla warfare back then, in light of a breakdown of political order in the Middle East after the downfall of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. As conflict between Israel and Hamas flares up again, the episode offers historical context for the current moment. I'm Benjamin Wittes, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, August 2nd, 2014. That is the voice of my Brookings colleague, Khaled El-Gindi, who joined us today along with Natan Sachs, also of Brookings, and a uh, Brookings colleague of a special note to Lawfare readers, Tamara Kaufman-Wittes, who, yes, is also my wife. Uh, We got together to talk about Gaza, about Israel, and about the regional politics surrounding the conflict that continues to go on despite the ceasefire that was supposed to go into effect this morning. We talked about tunnels. We talked about rockets, we talked about civilian casualties, and we talked about whether there is an end in sight. It's the Lawfare Podcast, Episode 86, War in Gaza. It's been a very ugly week. Let's start just by kind of assessing where we are. Um, There was supposed to be a ceasefire. It lasted 90 minutes or something. where are we? Where are we, and how did we get here? Khalid, get us started. Yeah, well, it seems to me where we are is where we've been the last 24 days, and that is kind of spiraling downwards uh, on this uh, continuous path. Um, and it seems to be beyond the control of anyone to 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 even stem uh, or or try to constrain this process, or even um, have it, uh, you know, if not reversed, at least try to to limit the deterioration um, it's there's just a, a glaring a glaring absence of uh, of any real credible third party mediation or intervention at this point and I think the the situation has just gotten so out of hand and how different is that from previous flare-ups in Gaza or uh, in southern Lebanon well in the past there was always I think a there was a regional balance of power, at least, that was able to constrain things or at least limit it in time and scope on some level. Uh, we saw that certainly two years ago in November 2012 when uh, when the conflict was basically nipped in the bud fairly early on. It was eight or nine days uh, because you had you had essentially a credible interlocutor in Egypt who could talk very credibly to both the Egyptians, and, uh, I'm sorry, to the Israelis and to Hamas. Now you you don't have that. Obviously, Mohammed Morsi and the Brotherhood are not in the picture, uh, and Hamas is actually uh, not just facing Israel, so to speak, on the battlefield, um, but it's also uh, confronting, in many ways, an uh, an attack by Egypt and Saudi Arabia. So it is, you know, this is a joint effort really directed against Hamas politically, militarily, and otherwise. That wasn't the case in the past. I want to return to that realignment, uh, joint effort component. How do you see it, Natan? What's the, how how did we get to this place where words like spinning out of control are are sort of the first things people say? Well, the the worry is, the worst case answer is that underlying it was an unstable uh, equilibrium, that there really wasn't... um, a balance of power that was sustainable between Israel and Hamas because of the deeply divergent interests, ideologies, philosophies, and the fact that Hamas is heavily armed in an area just adjacent to Israel. So in that interpretation, we just had a powder keg that was waiting for a trigger. The trigger was uh, kidnapping first of three Israeli teenagers, an Israeli operation to to find them that left Uh, several Palestinians dead and many Hamas people in jail, then revenge killings after their bodies were found, revenge killings, including one horrific one against a teenager in Jerusalem, a young teenager in Jerusalem, 
Um, and then, then it spiraled into, uh, into conflict in Gaza, basically. It spread from the West Bank to Gaza. But all this is the trigger. Underlying it is a balance of power that really was never fundamentally stable. The way the Israelis saw it was an attempt to have deterrence, something akin to what they have with Hezbollah in Lebanon, where Hezbollah, because of Lebanese pressure, would fear attacking Israel again after 2006. And to a certain degree, it's held. It may have held for other reasons, but to a certain degree, it held. That deterrence between Israel and Hamas, which was reestablished in 2012, broke down. And I'd add one more element, which is very worrisome, which is that it's unclear that inside Hamas we have the discipline that we had in the past. So even before this operation had a name in the Israeli jargon, uh, the Israelis were trying to get on board with an Egyptian attempt to cool things down. And as Khalid mentioned, the Egyptians are in a very different position. But I don't know, I honestly don't, whether the political wing in Hamas actually wanted to go along with it and simply could not have discipline over its military wing, or whether it, it was uh, disinterested. Uh, I would not be surprised, although I don't know this for a fact, that this morning as well, the, the political wing of Hamas maybe did think uh, this was enough for them, but they simply don't control the military wing. And for Israel, of course, that's a very worrying uh, situation if your enemy is, is uh, both dangerous but also undeterrable um, either because it doesn't care about civilians around, which is partly the case perhaps, but also because it's not unified. Uh, that is the worst case of all, and we may already be there. Tamara, to what extent is this a function of the breakdown in the, peace, the formal peace talks? Um, and to what extent is this just an episodic uh, flare-up of the sort that has been happening, you know, episodically for the past several years. You know, I think Natan is right to say that the underlying dynamic between Israel and Hamas was not stable and was perhaps a powder keg waiting for a trigger. But it's also true that the broader relationship between Israel and the Palestinians was unstable. And um, to a certain extent, in the absence of some form of political process that offered uh, a positive alternative, was a powder keg waiting for a trigger. Now, there were a number of us, including, I think, all three of us sitting here with you at this table, uh, who worried that the resumption of peace negotiations last summer might perversely raise the prospects for a violent crisis should peace talks break down, because you have this sort of roller coaster of heightened expectations, popular expectations on the two sides that were then crashed. Oddly enough, over the course of this nine-month uh, abortive peace negotiation, there was so much skepticism on both sides that I at least became less worried about that expectation crashing dynamic. Uh, and yet, to some extent, I think it's fair to say that as soon as the peace talks ended, as soon as the peaceful positive alternative was no longer on the table, some form of confrontation became inevitable. It was a question of where, when, and how. And what when you say some form of, of confrontation became inevitable, both sides seem to have been at some level preparing for this for a long time. There, the, the tunnels appear to be a fairly developed network over a period of time. And there is a sort of fatalism in Israel about the occasional need to go into to Gaza and deal with resurgent Hamas. So how much of that, what you just described, is that everybody sort of expected it to fail, but put things on hold until it did? And, I, 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 and how much of it is a, you know, th th that, that that is the, um, not the trigger because, but the trigger for the trigger? Well, look, that's the nature of unresolved longstanding conflicts, is that both sides are always preparing for the next round, even as they're perhaps hoping that they won't have to fight it. Uh, so to some extent, yes, that's built into the, the ongoing century-old Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, at the same time, I would say that both Israel and Hamas had choices here. They had alternatives uh, that they could have chosen that would have led to de-escalation instead of to the escalatory spiral that we're looking at today. Uh, when Israel uh, started its operation in the West Bank to search for the three uh, kidnapped Israeli teenagers, 
it took the opportunity uh, to strike a blow against emergent Hamas organization in the West Bank. It was already worried about that because of Hamas's reconciliation agreement with Fatah. So opportunistically, it did that. That exacerbated the dynamic with Hamas. Hamas also had a choice in response. It chose to uh, express its displeasure with the re-arrest of many of its operatives in the West Bank by starting to shoot rockets uh, against Israeli civilians and contributed to the escalatory spiral in that way. Once the, the, the back and forth got underway, the air operation and then the ground operation and, um, and Hamas using the tunnels, um, both sides then had very quickly high sunk costs, or at least they perceived it that way. Uh, a lot of Palestinians killed and injured very quickly, and a surprisingly uh, quick uh, tally of Israeli troops killed as well. And so it became harder for the leaders on both sides to step back from the brink. And indeed, now they seem to be sliding quickly deep into the chasm. So I want to throw this out for, for all of you. You know, one of, the, one of the troubling things about this conflict, particularly for a lawfare-oriented readership or listenership, is the disparity between uh, the way the Israelis understand their military activity vis-a-vis -vis civilians and the sheer number of civilian casualties. Um, the Israelis talk about their targeting procedures as very, very careful. Uh, a lot of people in the U.S. military take that very seriously and regard Israeli targeting procedures as, as you know, law of war compliant. Um, and yet, you look at operations in Gaza and there are a whole lot of dead civilians relative to the number of uh, dead lawful targets. Um, how should we think about this? Is this just a feature of close quarters urban warfare if you're not going to go street by street? Or is, or is there, you know, or is there an, another side to it that, that really is that the Israelis are less careful than they describe themselves as? Um, I think uh, a couple things. Before I hit that, I think it's important to kind of take a step back and look at the broader context. This conflict is happening in the context of a 67-year, you know, 100-year conflict between Israelis and Palestinians. Between, um, you know, you have a 47 year occupation and a seven year blockade of Gaza. That's the context in, w in which this is happening. And so that makes it fundamentally different than Hezbollah Israel conflict in Lebanon. There, is no there was no blockade in 2006 around Lebanon. The Shaba farm issue was not anywhere near as uh, emotive for Lebanese as, as the blockade in Gaza or the on uh, occupation. Uh, more broadly, is for Palestinians. So the notion of deterrence, I think, has to be looked at in the context of these very serious unresolved grievances. Um, in addition to the fact that 70% of Gaza's population, not coincidentally, are refugees. Um, so you, you really have a whole host of issues that are kind of, you know, densely, uh, you know, n not to, you know, no pun intended, but are sort of compacted into this uh, into this issue of the the Gaza Strip, so that that's that's one thing. As far as the civilian casualties and and rules of engagement and all of that, I think it's very hard to make the case um, that Israel is doing all it can to avoid civi civilian casualties. I think the reality is that you cannot have a seventy to eighty percent civilian casualty rate, of which a quarter or a third are children. And somehow that is acceptable in modern warfare. I think that's if, in fact, it's acceptable to kill hundreds and hundreds of innocent civilians and do massive destruction. Whole neighborhoods are destroyed. Homes are destroyed. 6,000 homes are completely destroyed. 400,000 Palestinians are displaced inside the Gaza Strip, um, an area that is hermetically sealed. They have nowhere to escape to. Uh, even Syrians uh, have at least, uh, they can escape the conflict to Turkey or to Jordan, someplace. There's no place 
for for Palestinians in Gaza to escape. And it makes the, that, I think, even more, I don't know any other word, but cruel um, to, it, it's, it's, you know, it's a bit like shooting fish in a barrel. I mean, there is literally no place in Gaza that is safe. Um, but more fundamentally, I think if we accept the notion that it's okay, it's acceptable, perhaps regrettable, but somehow legitimate to have the overwhelming majority of those killed be civilians in the hundreds, well over a thousand, then the law of war and, the, and, and, and laws to protect civilians in times of war are utterly meaningless. I mean, there is no point to them if, 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 that is the, if, if that's what's considered acceptable. And as far as, as far as I'm concerned, and certainly as far as Palestinians are concerned, the, the intention question, because there's always this morality issue of, well, Israel doesn't target intentionally a specific group of civilians and say, we want to kill them in order to send a message to their politicians or something along those lines. I think that line is effectively blurred. I mean, it's completely removed when you have, you know, if you say, you know, those Palestinians are not any less dead. Those children are not less dead because... Uh, because the the person pulling the trigger didn't know their name or wasn't aiming at them specifically. Um, The fact that it's considered acceptable to wipe out a family of 10 or 15 people in order to kill one man, um, I think really has to disturb our, our notion of wartime morality. I think we really need to call into question what is and what is not acceptable. Because if that's acceptable, then then I can, I can imagine um, terrorists uh, saying it's perfectly acceptable. If you're going to kill our civilians, whatever the justification, then we are going to kill your civilians. We are going to target them specifically because that is what will hurt you and you will have some measure of our pain. And so it's impossible for me to imagine how a security doctrine based on such overwhelming human misery can actually produce security. It's, it's actually mind-boggling. Natan, what do you think? You've, um, you see the same pictures, and yet there's a sense among a lot of Israelis, what are we supposed to do, right? We can't, we can't tolerate the rocketing, can't tolerate the tunneling, and yet there's, it's very, very difficult to target the targets while insulating the people around them. What do you make of the, de- the degree of, of civilian casualties here? And is there sort of more to say about it than, you know, it's very regrettable, but? Well, I mean, the first thing to say is that it, the, the scale of the tragedy is enormous. I mean, that's the first thing we should start with. And so the main question is how it can be stopped. I think fundamentally there is a very, there's a very strong distinction between the tactical level and the operational level. Um, Israelis get very indignant by the accusation that there's uh, purposeful targeting or that they're indifferent to, to lives. In particular, they point to U.S. Uh, operations in Afghanistan or elsewhere where there are enormous numbers of casualties as well, or in Somalia with Black Hawk Down, etc. And they would point out that on the tactical level, Israeli soldiers and officers are very strongly taught and retaught again and again to try and avoid civilian lives in a variety of different ways. And there really are of very big efforts to try and avoid it on the tactical level. But on the operational level, but it, it all depends, the tactical level, on the operation. So in the tactics, you avoid it when at all possible. But if there's a small unit or a platoon of soldiers in Gaza itself, and it's being fired upon from uh, many different directions, as was in Shaja'iya, part of Gaza, um, and they are in acute danger, and there were many dead, in fact, the Israeli firepower response will be enormous to try and get the soldiers out, enormous. And the damage to civilians is then enormous. And so the question, I think, for us, if we had a moment outside of the conflict to think, is, is how do we really apply or what do we think of the rules of engagement as Khaled alluded to? On the operational level, I think there is a sense in Israel that the sensitivity to loss on the Palestinian life is weaker than it was in the past in part because of the context. The Israeli view of the Gaza reality um, is a mirror image, perhaps, of what Khaled was describing, which is here's a territory that Israel had left completely, at least in terms of the the, uh, territory itself. 
uh, there was no blockade, and then Hamas gained power, or immediately actually, even, even before the withdrawal, Hamas fired from there and then gained power forcefully in the, in the Gaza Strip, creating a reality of, in a sense, a war between two entities. So the Israeli view of the blockade, and it was affirmed by the UN as well, is that it's perfectly legal because it is a blockade of an enemy territory that is trying to attack Israel. So obviously Israel is not going to allow weapons to enter that territory. All this creates a situation where for many Israelis, the view is, what do you want from us? What exactly is the alternative, as you pointed out? The most striking, I think, example was today or yesterday, Amos Oz, a famous Israeli author and very long-time peace activist, a peace now voice um, who started an interview with Deutsche Welle as saying, let me start by posing two questions to the readers. If your neighbor was holding their child on their lap and was uh, shooting machine gun into your nursery, what would you do? Or if they were doing the same thing and tunneling into your nursery, what would you do? And this may sound facetious, but it's the, it's the kind of question that really guides Israeli thinking about it. I'd say that what complicates this, in one regard... Uh, and this may sound outlandish, and I'm not advocating it, but in one regard, you could argue that reoccupying the Gaza Strip would be a better approach, even in terms of lives in the Gaza, in, in the Gaza Strip, than keep re- constantly returning to the cycle of violence. That if Israel cannot live with a Hamas-ruled Gaza Strip that keeps firing at Israeli uh, civilians, even if Israeli defenses are now good, um, it should simply reoccupy completely. But I'd say that deeper down, there's, there's a problem, perhaps a legal problem, in terms of how international law thinks about this. We have a hybrid group here. It's not simply a terrorist organization. It's also a very large political party. It, it won at least a plurality of the votes in the last Palestinian election about a decade ago. Um, it sees itself as a legitimate government of Gaza and is treated as such by some. And it, it is, in a sense, both. So it's an army, it's a militia, it's a terrorist group, but it's also a government. And it completely flaunts the, the rules of law. We're not even discussing. I and mean, it's not even a topic, I guess, for, of course, for our blog, understandably, because it's not interesting. Hamas doesn't claim to adhere to the rules of law. It never did. Um, and so how does one deal with that? And it, it's the absolute tragedy of the civilian death in Gaza can blind us to the very difficult dilemma of what exactly does one do with a group like this, which fires completely from within a population, It's also very hard to get away from population in Gaza, but it is actively trying to hide among the population um, and puts Israel in a terrible dilemma. I think, at least at the theoretical level, the consequences would be too terrible, but at least at the theoretical level, it may be, in fact, better for all involved if Israel simply toppled Hamas completely. So part of the dilemma that Hamas poses is that it controls part of the Palestinian polity, but not the entirety of it. And tomorrow, how, so adding to all the complexity that Natan just described is um, the added layer of a divided, to the extent there's sovereignty, authority uh, on the Palestinian part. You uh, You have Hamas, and then you have this entirely different power structure in the West Bank, um, Talk about the Palestinian politics here um, and what this conflict does to the divisions within the, the Palestinian movement um, and to what extent what we're moving toward is, is a final confrontation between Israel and Hamas or is, does Hamas emerge strengthened from this? Look, I think the dynamic of this conflict um, is like many in the sense that it creates a rally around the flag effect. It creates greater unity uh, both amongst Israelis and amongst Palestinians. But I'm not sure that rebounds to the benefit of uh, the the Palestinian Authority or uh, the Fatah movement or even the PLO writ large. Um, I think that to the that that unity perforce. Um, pushes people in the direction of Hamas and even Mahmoud Abbas, uh, the head of the PLO and Fatah and the Palestinian Authority, um, has felt compelled, I think, to make statements in support of uh, the resistance. So it it has a, a perverse effect of pushing people to the right, and that's certainly not unique to Palestinian politics by any means. And yet, if I could just push you on that, he's made statements... And yet this is the, not the first time there has been an eruption in Gaza that is not paralleled by a major eruption in the West Bank. Uh, 
Well, look, first of all, I would say we saw demonstrations in the West Bank and in East Jerusalem before the eruption of rocket fire from Gaza in response to the Israeli operations in the West Bank that Natan was speaking about a few minutes ago where some Palestinians were killed, and then in response to this horrific revenge killing of the Palestinian teenager from Jerusalem. Um, And demonstrations have continued to crop up in the West Bank and East Jerusalem in the weeks since. It's not getting attention. The international reporters are in Gaza and they can't get out right now. Uh, So it's not getting a lot of focus, but it is ongoing. And I think there's a significant concern and there should be even more concern that one consequence of this crisis is that those demonstrations are directed not only against Israel, Uh, but also against the Palestinian Authority, which has been Israel's resolute partner in security in the West Bank. Uh, And the only reason those demonstrations haven't been bigger and more troublesome to Israel is because of PA security cooperation uh, with Israeli forces and the Israeli government. And, you know, I think that gets to a, a broader and deeply ironic component of the dynamic that we have right now, which is that um, over the last two years, since the last uh, outbreak of violence, um, Prime Minister Netanyahu has had multiple opportunities to strengthen the stream within Palestinian politics, um, manifested most concretely by Mahmoud Abbas, that favors a negotiated two-state solution, a compromise, coexistence with Israel. And he has repeatedly declined those opportunities. In all of the last year of supposed peace negotiations, those two leaders did not meet once. Uh, And they spoke on the phone only after the Israeli teenagers were kidnapped, only in the midst of a crisis. So, and... It, there's a strong argument to be made that a number of actions of the Israeli government during the peace negotiations um, undercut Abbas's argument to Palestinians that there was something to be gained from talking to Israel. Uh, and, and so after a period in which Abbas saw his own position weakened, um, we now have a violent conflict, which is strengthening his primary adversary even more. And in which he can't engage that adversary as an adversary. Look, that's right, because every time there's violence, it undercuts the argument that there's, you know, every time there's violence and there's a ceasefire that results in some concrete benefit to Hamas, Uh, it undermines the argument that the peaceful path is the better path. You know, I remember uh, November 2012, immediately after the last ceasefire, Salam Fayyad, the former Palestinian prime minister, spoke here at Brookings. And he said uh, that he and those like him who believed in a nonviolent path to Palestinian sovereignty and independence were the losers from the last round of the Israel-Hamas conflict. If that was true two years ago, it's true in spades today. Who are the losers on the Israeli side, Natan? Well, uh, just if I have kind of one word on that, that's also an argument not to make concessions to Hamas in the context of war. And <laughs> yes. it is a, it's an argument both to engage Abbas seriously, and of course the argument can be made that both sides were not uh, sincere and serious enough in, in the negotiations, but it's also an argument to be made not to concede to Hamas under fire. Um, Who else are the losers? Well, the Israeli public opinion mirroring the Palestinian one is overwhelmingly for this operation. I can't emphasize that enough. The numbers are astoundingly high. Um, And it is fundamental. I just quoted Amos Oz. And and what's more interesting is that I was not flabbergasted to read that from Amos Oz. And to emphasize this, Amos Oz is a voice of the Peace Now demonstrations. He's someone you would hear in a Peace Now demonstration, every one of them. it is, and it's primarily because the adversary, the enemy in this conflict, is Hamas that embodies just about everything that Israelis feel they have no choice about. So you know, Hamas, in, it, there used to be a debate about Yasser Arafat, if he's serious about peaceful means or not. And the argument was that in English he often says the right words, in Arabic not always, but sometimes he does. And then Hamas is pretty consistent whatever language and, they and, speak. And then the third, the third question was always his actions, which were sometimes okay. After the bombings in 96, he clamped down on Hamas before he didn't. 
Hamas is, is uh, very, very consistent in every language and every message. It's, uh, it is completely opposed to long-term reconciliation with Israel. It has spoken, when it speaks the most reconciliatory tone in, for example, an op-ed for the Washington Post, which um, had the, uh, the name of Ismail Ania over it, um, they talked about a long-term Hudna, and this has been mentioned, Hudna being a long-term ceasefire. So they will never accept Israel permanently, but they will agree not to fight it for 20 or 30 years. So for Israelis, what this does on the Israeli side, and plus this perception that, that there, there's simply no talking to them, every single attempt at a ceasefire like this morning uh, ends the way it does. So in the Israeli public, it's a very widespread consensus. There are some dissenting views, of course. There are, many people are very concerned about the civilian, or genuinely concerned about, concerned about the civilian loss of life in the Gaza Strip, but there are very few fundamentally think it's Israel's fault. There is a strong, there's a strengthening of the right wing inside Netanyahu's own party, the Likud. We have people breaking from him, most notably the Ministry of Education. Gidon Sal, who sees himself as a potential heir, has now broken rank as well and called for a much more forceful operation in the Gaza Strip. Netanyahu is perceived to have led a very cautious, gradual, mild operation. It may sound strange if you look at the pictures in Gaza, but this is very much the perception in Israel. And from an operational level, it has reason. Netanyahu and the defense minister have been attempting to get out of this uh, several times, although not shy about using force when they were in. Um, and perhaps more sensationally, the foreign minister, uh, Viktor Lieberman, for his own reasons as well, has broken with Netanyahu. They were allies in the last election, and he's now competing uh, for, in a sense, the title of leader of the right wing with Naftali Bennett, another uh, right wing minister. And all of them are talking about a reluctance on Netanyahu's part to uh, the, the term in Israel, it's a very bad one, is to let the IDF win. The idea is the IDF could win if you just gave it a chance once and for all. And uh, in some sense it's true, the IDF could, could take the Gaza Strip. The cost to lives on the Palestinian side and on the Israeli side would be horrendous. And of course there's the mild question of what happens the day after, which no one has a very good answer for. Which begs the question of what exactly winning is. Um, and, and, and I would uh, I would say that it's uh, it's actually impossible for in that instance for for Israel to win. Of course, I mean it's a question of military power. Israel clearly is the uh, far superior to anything Palestinians could muster up. In fact, the entire Arab world uh, couldn't uh, couldn't pose uh, a, a, a serious threat to Israel militarily, much less you know a, a group groups of non-state actors. Uh, with relatively primitive weapons. So that's not a, any question. I mean, it's a question of who has more firepower. Clearly, the Israelis do. The question is whether the political objectives uh, of Israel can be achieved. And the political objectives, I think, of any Israeli government is to bring security to its citizens. Uh, and if, if it has to kill 1,500 people in order to feel that it is bringing security to its people, I would suggest that they are actually not bringing security to their people. And consider this, I mean, I would just engage in a very simple exercise of putting oneself in someone else's shoes. I understand 95% of Israeli public is gung-ho 100% for, uh, you know, for continuing beyond maybe even where the political leadership uh, would like to go. If that's the case in Israel, which has uh, withstood uh, 66, uh, or I don't know, 60 Israeli soldiers have been killed, three civilians, I believe, um, but other than that, and the closure of, of the airport for two days, life goes on normally in Israel. People go to the beach, people go to the pubs, there are sirens, but there is nothing like, I mean, if that's the case in Israel, what is, what is true of where the Palestinian psychology is after being literally terrorized for 24 days, day and night, nonstop bombing? Um, so... Israelis may conceive of this as targeting Hamas, our bitter foe, who is, uh, you know, determined, you know, committed to our destruction. But at the end of the day, um, politically, Hamas is actually benefiting. If you know, obviously military, militarily, it's it's taking very serious hits. But for Hamas, it's not primarily a military battle. The battle is for Palestinian hearts and minds, and that is uh, where they are winning. And so, imagine you have. 400,000 displaced, 6,000 homes destroyed, 1,500 dead, of which 300 are children. So what is the psychology of those Palestinians as far as their views about Israel? 
Um, obviously, it's going to be, uh, there's going to be intense hatred. There's no Palestinian who's going to say, well, Hamas was firing from next to my house. It's really their fault. Um, you know, Hamas started this. They shouldn't have kidnapped those three kids. Uh, so I guess my kid deserved to die. There, that, that's not how, that's, you know, that's how outside groups rationalize to themselves their own actions, but that's not how the people who are bearing the brunt of, of, of the uh, pain and, and, and loss are, are interpreting it. They're seeing this as not a result of what Hamas did since 2006. This is not a conflict that began in 2006. They're seeing it in the context of an age-old conflict that they have you know, and the fact that these are Palestinians are overwhelmingly refugees. Palestinians, whether we agree or not, the overwhelming majority of them see this as a continuation of the Nakba, of, of, you know, you drove them out of their, their homes and villages in, in what is now Israel. You locked them up inside this tiny little Gaza Strip, and now you're trying to either eliminate them or, or uh, expel them yet again. That's the Palestinian narrative. They can't possibly blame Hamas. When they see Hamas uh, as an extension of the resistance before them, it was Fatah. And everything that Israel says now about Hamas, it said literally almost verbatim about the PLO and Fatah uh, just 30, 40 years ago. The most evil group, you cannot possibly ever sit down with them. They are implacable, committed to our destruction. But the same, you know, it, it, there's, there's, there's a context and a history here and a continuity that is completely neglected. The fact that Israel left Gaza but closed the door and locked, you know, uh, lo locked it up afterwards, that's not leaving. And I think by any definition of Israel still controls every, every aspect of life in Gaza. And that's the test, is effective control. Israel even controls the population registry in Gaza. So the notion that we left and, you know, we, it's, what, you know, we didn't do anything wrong. Why, why are they so upset with us? Well, you locked the door. Uh, and it became increasingly uh, tightened uh, after, of course, Hamas was elected. But this notion that Israel, you know, we left and we're no longer responsible is nonsense. I don't think any, any international lawyer would actually argue that Gaza is not occupied. I think even... According to the United States, uh, Gaza is still considered uh, occupied. So what about the Egyptian narrative about this, which has changed a great deal in the last few, you know, since, since the last go-around? Um, as you pointed out earlier, this is, re this is in some ways a joint Israeli-Egyptian uh, project. One of the borders of Gaza, to the extent that it is sealed, is sealed by the Egyptians, not by the Israelis. And the um, criticism of the Israeli operation in a lot of the Arab states has been very, very muted. How should we understand the, the, polit the, 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 the Arab state politics of this operation relative to prior ones, and to what extent does it reflect significant strains in Egyptian and Saudi and Jordanian public opinion? Um, I think we have to distinguish between two things. There is the uh, attitude toward Hamas in particular, and the attitude, uh, public and even governmental attitudes toward the, the Palestinian issue in general. Um, attitude towards Hamas, of course, they ebb and flow. Right now, they're on a particular uh, they're, they're moving in a direction that is against Hamas. Uh, the, the, and I think this goes a long way to explaining Hamas's sense of that this is an actual existential threat to them. They, they have no choice. They're, they're going to die either way. Um, they might as well, instead of fading quietly into the night, they might as well go out fighting. Uh, because they're not just facing Israel, they're also facing uh, Egypt uh, and Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia. That is I think just as determined to crush Hamas as uh, as Benjamin Netanyahu, so uh, that's the context in which that's happening. But for now, public opinion has been able to be neutralized. I Arab public opinion, particularly in Egypt, has been neutralized because of the anti-Muslim Brotherhood sentiment uh, for the most of the last year or more. Um, which has now extended to Hamas. Hamas is seen, of course, as an affiliate of the Brotherhood and therefore um, an enemy of Egypt in the same way that the Brotherhood uh, is an enemy to Egypt, even though they are uh, Egyptians. Uh, 
So in, in that sense, it, it's helped, I think, prolong this conflict because it neutralized what would have been, I think, an immediate public sense of outrage. But I think that's starting to break now. I think the, as, as this goes on, uh, the fact that we're seeing statements from the Egyptians and the Saudis on this issue uh, suggests that they're starting to feel the pinch and that the costs are beginning to outweigh the benefits for them. You know, I, I think that Khalid was just talking about the increasing divergence between Egyptian public opinion and the position of the Egyptian government on this conflict, and that's real and I would agree growing. But there's another complication for, for Egypt and the government of Egypt in this situation the longer the conflict goes on, and especially if Israel chooses to go deeper into a ground war or even to try and oust Hamas, if you will, if it, that's even possible, from Gaza. Um, Egypt's role has been very different this time because Egypt and Israel have, up until this point, had a stronger alliance of interests on Hamas than they've ever had in the past. In the past, Egypt could broker a ceasefire because it had leverage over Hamas, because it controlled the Rafah border crossing, but it also had leverage over Israel, because there were a lot of things that Egyptians and Israelis do together that are important for Israeli security and Israel's diplomatic relations. Um, today, uh, Egypt has demonstrated its unwillingness <laughs> to exercise that leverage over Israel to hold it back at all from the conflict. And so it has not been able to effectively broker a ceasefire. Some have even questioned if it wanted to broker a ceasefire. But if Israel goes deeper into Gaza, and particularly if Israel adopts the war aim of trying to eliminate Hamas rule or push Hamas out, then I think Egypt has a bigger problem, not only because Egyptian public sentiment will become more and more of an issue for an Egyptian president who is still um, dealing with a lot of domestic disorder, uh, but also because one consequence of such an Israeli operation might well be to push Hamas and even more extreme jihadi groups that have been resident in Gaza into the Sinai desert. Egypt is already waging a low level but quite uh, persistent counterinsurgency campaign in Sinai, and it's not been doing very well against these guys. It's lost dozens of soldiers in the last few months. Uh, and I'm sure that the last thing they want is for that problem to get worse, to face their public opinion, not only that they're backing Israel against the Palestinians of the Gaza Strip, but also that they are... Um, uh, enabling a deterioration of their own domestic security. I think this Egyptian government is probably going to want to see this war come to an end fairly soon. So where do we go from here? What is there? I mean, it, it, it looks a lot less optimistic than it did this morning. Um, what, what, what's the regroup now that, that puts things on a road toward a quiet down? You know, sadly, both sides have now suffered additional losses. That means both sides are going to be looking to gain more on the ground before they stop hitting each other. That means we're going to have to wait uh, before I think they will be prepared to consider a new ceasefire. Um, now, it's, it's possible that sufficient pressure from a, a wide enough range of international actors, and that means the Saudis, the Egyptians, but also the Qataris and the Turks who have been backing Hamas, also the United States and the Europeans who could, you know, in, in theory, um, bring in a broader degree of international pressure and institutional pressure. It, it's possible that those might uh, help constrain the escalatory impulses here. But I think that operates much more on the Israeli side than on the Hamas side. And I think as, as long as Hamas keeps fighting, Israel will keep fighting. Um, however it happens that the two sides are again willing to contemplate taking a breather or calling it a day, uh, to me the, the bigger question is what happens next. And I think everything that Khaled and Natan were saying about the po political dynamics inside Israel, inside Palestine, and between them um, suggests that it is very important to follow a ceasefire and whatever concessions that ceasefire might bring to Hamas in terms of prisoner releases or re relaxation of the closure, that has to be not just balanced but overwhelmed by uh, uh, 
process of political and economic gains that would reinforce um, a negotiated two-state solution rather than winning concessions through conflict. I think there's there's an element in which um, the Egyptian approach to ceasefire may be the only shot, the only chance we have. And I think even this morning, there is reason to suspect that they could succeed. They do hold the keys at the end of the day. They always did. They did in previous rounds as well, and they do today too. Uh, the ceasefire failed because someone in the Gaza Strip, it might be Hamas military wing, it might be another uh, group, uh, broke it about an, an hour and a half or two into it. But it did seem that the Palestinian factions, including Hamas, were willing to go along with the, with the Egyptian ceasefire. And I think it's very important that we emphasize that, we, the United States and everyone else, emphasize that route. Um, in particular, given what we talked about earlier, concessions to Hamas are not ju- just a matter of the co- substance of them. It's a question of doing it in the context of this war. Hamas should not gain from this war. Uh, the same concessions and much more should be given to Abbas in the context of negotiations, but they should not be given to Hamas in this context. And the Egyptian concern, I'm no expert on Egypt, uh, unlike my two colleagues here, but the Egyptian concern, uh, certainly from the Israeli point of view, is not only of what happens in Sinai if there's unrest, etc., but it's also, that's part of the problem with opening the border and part of the reason that they did treat the tunnels between Sinai and the Gaza Strip very forcefully. Uh, the Gaza Strip is much smaller than Sinai, but it has a much bigger population uh, than Sinai. And a lot of the troubles in Sinai were not only coming from Libya and elsewhere, but were coming from the Gaza Strip. And so this severing between the Sinai and the Gaza Strip, which was, is, is so fundamentally difficult for Hamas and curtailed it in terms of finances and others, um, is very important to the Egyptians for their own national security, which I suspect is going to be paramount in any of their considerations. But in the broader context... There is a very bitter struggle here in the Arab world between the Egyptian, Saudi, UAE camp and Qatar on the other side with Turkey sort of in the backdrop, not an Arab country, but sort of aligned there. Um, and the, the deep dismay in, in this Arab camp and Israel along with it from the idea of bringing the Turks and the Qataris as central brokers of this whole thing uh, is a very deep issue that is, goes beyond this, this specific conflict. I think it's, it's very important to try and use every leverage one can have on Hamas, including Turkey and Qatar. It's very important that it is not done in a way that uh, preferences them, the Qataris or anyone else, over a camp that is much more productive, much more constructive in any of these regards. And most importantly, the one that holds the best possibility of producing, I think, the only silver lining of this whole story. The silver lining may be that if a ceasefire is reached, as I hope as soon as possible, it will likely include some kind of return of forces loyal to Abbas to, for example, the border between Sinai and Gaza. al Khalid has written about this recently. And I think this is, this is the silver lining. These are forces that the Egyptians can trust, unlike Hamas. It's forces that the Israelis can trust, unlike Hamas. I think rightly so. And I think it is the very beginning. It's a limited beginning, but it's the beginning of bring, bringing the PA back to the Gaza Strip and giving some real security context, context to what they were talking about, the reconciliation. I also think it may be an opportunity for the Israelis to come off uh, uh, their position that was completely shutting off any possibility of dealing with the government that had the reconciliation behind it. And it would behoove the Israelis and everyone if this was actually an opportunity to engage with it, since the government is technocratic, it includes no one from Hamas, it's under the leadership of Abbas and his people, and it's committed, most importantly, to the uh, obvious uh, re- um, conditions in the international community of uh, renouncing violence and recognizing Israel and uh, adhering to previous um, agreements. In other words, if there's a silver lining, and lest I sound optimistic, it's a very, very small one given what we've been through in the last few weeks, is that perhaps forces loyal to Abbas, something in the model that we saw in 2005, um, would come into the border between uh, Sinai and Gaza. This would alleviate the Egyptians con- Egyptian concerns about this connection and could also alleviate some of the Israeli concerns. Khalid, we'll give you the final word. Is there a silver lining here? Well, I, mean, <clears throat> I agree with Natan, actually, that that is the silver lining. And um, I actually wrote about this two and a half years ago in the last Gaza conflict under the heading of how to avoid the next Gaza war, that if, if we're going to avoid the, the next Gaza war, we need to come to terms with on the one hand, Gaza is not separate separate from the West Bank. Its future is not separate from the West Bank. Hamas is not separate from the peace process and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, 
uh, and you need to resolve them all together. The way to do that is to end the blockade in Gaza, and uh, it, it, the only way to, o- to end the blockade in Gaza and open the borders is to bring, as Natan said, uh, the PA back uh, to, uh, to police the border. But the only way to do that is in the context of Palestinian reconciliation, uh, because it's not going to happen by imposing, uh, imposing it on Hamas. Hamas has to be on board since they're the de facto rulers of Gaza. And so it's, there, there is a way, uh, I think, to structure an arrangement where everybody gets something. Uh, and, and that way, frankly, when people's interests are interconnected, that is... Uh, uh, that is what mitigates and, and prevents future conflict, is when the, the, the people you're fighting uh, or your, your rival enemy uh, has, when you have as much to lose from their having something to lose as you do. So uh, I, I think zero-sum propositions are self-fulfilling and self-reinforcing. You know, uh, um, and so the way to do this is Hamas won't be eliminated. Uh, it's certainly been weakened. But it needs to be reintegrated into, uh, into the Palestinian polity. And that way, if it has a stake in the process, it, will, uh, it, 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 it is much less likely to be disruptive to that process. So I think that is a sea change uh, that has to happen in American thinking uh, first, uh, and then eventually in Israeli thinking, um, because continuing to treat the Palestinians as though they're two separate conflicts. We make peace with the guys in the West Bank and war and the guys in Gaza, and then somehow that will work out is, I think, nonsensical and hasn't worked, and it's actually exacerbated conflict. Thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Thanks this week to the folks in the Brookings studio for helping us record this episode. Our music, as always, is performed by Sophia Yan. And you are not doing your job in sharing the Lawfare podcast on social media, tweeting us and forcing us down in the throats of your Facebook friends. Get on it, people. Thanks for listening.